Our last speaker, our last speaker for today is Dr. Enya Tassiorti. Uh, he is an associate professor of Nanomedicine Institute for Academic Medicine, director Center for Biomimetic Medicine, Department of Regenerative Medicine, and director Surgical Advanced Technology Laboratory, Department of Orthopedics and Sport Medicine, Houston Methodist. And the title of the talk is uh, Nanobio Interface and Intrinsic Bio Activity of Biomimetic Nanoparticles. Well, some of you might have already heard my talk yesterday, and this is a similar talk on the same, on the same platform technologies, but from a little bit of a, a different perspective. So we're going to focus here on what happens on the nanobio interface. And I just, as a, as a context, because I didn't introduce myself, I work in Houston, where there is the largest medical center in the world, all of these skyscrapers here. This is not the downtown Houston, that is downtown Houston. These are all biomedical research institute hospitals. More than 120,000 people work uh, in this uh, uh, area. And uh, I work at Methodist, which is a hospital mainly that just recently built uh, this new research institute, which is connected to the hospital. And that is just to foster and in improve uh, the ability to work uh, with clinicians. And so a lot of the things that we do are uh, aiming uh, at improving uh, uh, patient therapy. And uh, you saw in the title, and this is kind of a mantra, every time you uh, hear me talking, I always talk about biomimicry. And this is really like something I truly believe in. I'm a molecular biologist by training, uh, I'm not an engineer. So I kind of like look at nature as the biggest uh, R&D department in the world. Uh, they've been doing that for a few billion years. So there's a lot to learn there. And, uh, and other areas of technology, engineering, and materials have already looked at nature as inspiration. And I wanted to kind of apply that uh, to drug delivery. And if you think about what you want to do with drug delivery, is that you want to navigate in the blood uh, and find your target and uh, get into uh, the tissue and release your drug. And this is something that cells do very well. And certain type of cells uh, are kind of like, that's their job. And these are immune cells, leukocytes, T cells, macrophages. They are able to identify the right spot in the vasculature, adhere stably to it, and even do the transmigration and the deep tissue penetration. And so I thought, all right, can we do that with nanoparticles? Can we make uh, particles that look and act like cells? And this is uh, uh, something that we took very seriously and that we developed over the years in two main platforms. Uh, one that is called the look-alike, which was kind of a joke to say the look-alike. And the joke sounds much better when an American says it. Uh, with my accent, it doesn't really make sense. But uh, the idea was that uh, I can take a leukocyte, uh, extract uh, the membrane proteins, uh, and actually the whole membrane, and then uh, patch it uh, around uh, whatever type of nanoparticle. In this case, it was a silicon particle. But the idea is that once this particle is camouflaged uh, by the membrane, uh, and we inject it in the circulation, it does uh, some of the things that the leukocytes uh, uh, do. And, um, and, and this was like a, a something that kind of got us into that field. But then we realized this was still a little bit complex. So there was a lot of moving parts. Uh, and so we went to a simpler uh, formulations where now the membrane patches are actually uh, broken down in individual proteins. And then the proteins are reconstituted with synthetic lipids uh, into um, a a, another biomimetic particle that we call the leukosome, because they look kind of liposomes, but they come from uh, leukocytes. Um, and, uh, and we do it in two different ways. So we had to develop different uh, uh, manufacturing uh, protocols uh, to address uh, uh, that. So the top one is the one that we uh, used for the Nature Nanotechnology paper in 2013, and it's based on sonication, uh, lysis of cells, uh, and uh, sucrose gradients to identify the plasma membrane band. And in this case, what you get is really patches of membranes. The second one is instead the one that we applied for the leukosome uh, platform, where instead we uh, go ahead and uh, kind of like identify and purify through some magnetic beads uh, exactly the type of products that we need. And, uh, and this was uh, uh, kind of like how we did it. So this is the first approach with the silicon particle that now it's covered by membranes, and so it should look like a cell. And we did a lot of uh, chemistry to make sure that the orientation was kept uh, um, maintained, because obviously proteins work uh, uh, if the, the orientation is maintained. And also uh, we tried to understand uh, 
in which fraction of the different sucrose gradients we had the highest accumulation of the proteins that we wanted. Um, uh, this is said, it's uh, the other two methods that we have developed now on the leucosome. The first one is uh, uh, the kind of the proof of concept and is based on the fin film hydration and extrusion protocols, kind of common. And, uh, and we have now developed a high fruit, like a, a, a high yield. Uh, um, um, system based on microfluidics where we inject uh, through two channels the aqua solution containing all the proteins, the ethanol solution containing all the lipids, uh, and through this chip uh, we, we get the same thing that we used to get uh, but a better yield and better uh, consistency. Um, and this is uh, uh, part of uh, the characterization, and it's scattered through different papers, but we took a lot of time trying to understand both the physical, chemical, mechanical, and energetic uh, um, uh, rules that govern the assembly of these structures. Uh, and in particular, what was very important was for us to understand if proteins could get integrated in the proteolipid bilayer in the right orientation. Because again, in this case, we don't isolate patches with all membranes already assembled, but we isolate uh, single uh, proteins with a little bit of lipid, uh, uh, lipids around. Uh, and what we found out is that uh, this conformation is uh, energetically favorable because of static hindrance that uh, the extracellular domain of a protein would have if, if it's instead inside uh, the, uh, the core. Um, we also try to understand what was the stability. Obviously, these are very complex systems. Uh, they have a lot of proteins. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that over time, uh, we could uh, uh, still rely on the formulation and use it and maintain all the function. And so we, we had different ways. Uh, all these different lines uh, uh, correspond to a different uh, uh, approach, synthetic approach. And then we, we kind of uh, uh, eliminated the one that were not very stable, the red lines. We focused on the, uh, the other three ones that instead were very stable. And then we went on uh, to understand uh, the other aspects. So it was not just a question of stability, how much they remain, uh, 120 nanometers over time, but also how much of the proteins that we were interested in we could uh, keep inside. Uh, and uh, sorry. And uh, we do that uh, using uh, flow cytometry. This is kind of like a, uh, something that we developed in the lab, but try to uh, treat nanoparticles almost as if they are cell and do all the classic uh, stainings that people uh, do through fax uh, to understand how much of the proteins that we wanted were expressed on the surface. We then went uh, into a more extensive uh, uh, proteomic analysis, we did MALDI and uh, CMS, uh, uh, just to identify all the different proteins that uh, uh, were in, the, uh, in this complex, uh, and also to make sure that uh, uh, they were in the right orientation, which uh, you can check uh, uh, by controlling uh, the sugar moieties. So these are uh, proteins that uh, maintain the post-translational modification. This is one of the beauties of this approach. Rather than uh, making recombinant protein in a bacteria, we isolate these uh, proteins once they're mounted already on a cell. And that uh, makes these uh, uh, molecules particularly uh, effective. Um, so, as I said, we did a, a, a very extensive uh, um, LCMS approach to identify all the different peptides and proteins that we identified. We gave to all of these proteins a name, and with the name came the function. And, uh, and when we started to understand what happens to these once we inject them uh, in the blood system, and these uh, uh, particles start their journey through the blood. And obviously, uh, being different in composition, their protein corona is different. This is just, uh, just came out in CS Nano, and it's uh, the first time that the protein corona of a biomimetic system was described. And uh, to do that, we looked again at everything. The, the chemical, physical, energetic uh, um, properties. And you see that after they're injected in vivo, their size uh, goes a little bit larger. And over uh, time, in one, in one hour, they're now all clustered together. So this was the first indication that uh, the protein corona was actually grouping uh, um, uh, particles together. Um, we then uh, tried to identify the different uh, proteins that were 
shared by the two, uh, the control liposomes and the leukosome, but more importantly on the unique proteins that instead remain stably adhering uh, on the leukosome. And these are proteins that we believe uh, determine the biological function uh, of these uh, uh, particles. Because when you now incubate uh, these particles with macrophages, uh, macrophages uh, internalize uh, these particles only if they have uh, a protein uh, corona around, uh, in case of liposomes, uh, but they never internalize the leukosome. And that is because probably the protein corona that forms around these structures has some form of a protective uh, uh, function. And what we think, this is kind of like the last slide, I promise, uh, and uh, what happens with complement and IgG that attaches on a liposome is that they attach very randomly. And this leaves exposed uh, the domain that is actually bound by macrophages through the FC receptor to internalize. But if you now have the FC receptor on the surface uh, of the leukosome, because uh, the FC receptor comes from the surface of the leukocyte here, this green, now the uh, IgG bind in a completely different uh, orientation and that prevents them uh, from interacting further. So this is kind of like, uh, I'm gonna uh, quickly summarize that uh, this is just at the beginning of this uh, investigation. We know that there is more that this uh, uh, protein corona does in terms of bioactivity of other function and, uh, and we're very excited to understand how we can now tune the composition of the proteins to then determine the composition of the protein corona. And again, I wanna thank my team in particular. This is the work of Claudia Corbo, very, very talented uh, uh, proteomic uh, postdoc that is now in uh, the lab of uh, Omid Farouk Roberto Molinaro, who's again uh, the guy that developed uh, uh, the uh, leukosome technology, and Alessandro Parodi, also uh, Roberto is now at Harvard, uh, and Alessandro Parodi is now a professor at Northwestern, who was the inventor and the developer of the Lugolike. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Questions? Uh, thank you for a really nice talk. I uh, just want to ask, uh, when you extract the protein from the cells, how do you make sure that the conformation of the protein is still correct? Well, you gotta pay attention on how you work with uh, uh, proteins. So, so you maintain the temperature low, and uh, you can do some circular decroism to make sure that uh, the conformation is the same. Eventually, you also use antibodies uh, that are sensitive to the particular conformation of the uh, proteins just to make sure that uh, the protein is not just there in presence, but it's there also in the fully functional domain. So that's how we did it. Very interesting work, thank you. Um, did you look at whether uh, the rate, well, the density of these proteins makes a difference to mm -hmm. how they behave? Yes. It, it, it does, and uh, in the Nature Material paper, we did a lot of uh, characterization of what was the protein to lipid ratio in order to understand both uh, the ability to assemble the structure, because there is uh, some static engines and some curvature issues. If you have too many proteins, uh, the lipids cannot curve enough uh, to do a small uh, lipid, and it also contributes to the overall stability of the structure. So there are energetic components, and the paper is under uh, revision now, but we've done a lot of modeling uh, uh, to, to understand uh, what was also the right uh, density. So it's but also a size issue? Of, of course it's a size issue. If, if you go to, back to the niche material, that is very well uh, uh, described in the supplementary. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now we would like to conclude the session. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending the speaker Thank who you. presented. Thank you very much.